Good afternoon. Welcome to Coronavirus and Our Mental Health. Today is April 27th, and we're in the, still in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I'm Ken Burtness coming to you from Holly Eva uh, on the North Shore. I don't know how many of you saw the Time Magazine latest issued, uh, but it came to my house today and mentioned that for the first time, we're at a million people who have died in this country from the coronavirus, very sobering statistic. The thing we're tracking right now is the beta alpha two variant of Omicron, uh, itself very, very contagious. Uh, and the percentage of positives for coronavirus due to this beta alpha two variant is increasing. Uh, the one thing that scientists are really worried about is we don't yet know how effective our vaccines are gonna be against this particular variant. To talk about this and other things, I have my good friend, Steve Katz uh, with me today. Uh, you probably recognize him. Uh, he was the host for a number of years right here on Think Tech Hawaii on the program Shrink Wrap, which I always admired the title to that. That was always a lot of fun. Steve, like other therapists uh, has, an overwhelming caseload since the pandemic began. And he just comes to us after leaving a client. And I really appreciate Steve, you being here. I know you're very busy. Welcome to the program. Oh, thank you very much, Ken. It's uh, lovely to talk with you, whether it's just the two of us or uh, to all six people. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the things Steve and I talked about earlier was I asked him about his clients and asked him if uh, what they were bringing up when they when he talked with them about the coronavirus. And Steve told me, he said, well, they don't talk about the coronavirus very much. He said for them to be talking about the coronavirus would be like fish talking about water. Uh, it's an overwhelming reality. It is there all the time. Uh, and so <laughs> the uh, they wind up talking about uh, the other problems that I have that are exacerbated so much by the pandemic. Steve, I was hoping, uh, I, one, I love the metaphor. I thought the metaphor was very appropriate. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your ideas on this. Well, um, it's not hard to remember because it seems like every time I have a session, uh, I come up with good examples. I mean, I'm a marriage and family therapist, so my focus is about human relationships. And um, people always have issues, you know, trying to get along with each other, to love each other in a kind way, and to, you know, maximize that. And that's usually why they come to see me. It's about some relationship they're having in their life. And that's that's always the case, except now there's like there's like i said there's always people coming but there's a lot more people coming because relationships can be stressful and a lot of times most most of the time people don't need to see a therapist um a certain number of people do but a lot more do because the stress that they're starting out from when everything is okay is already quite high, you know, it's up to here. But when regular issues come up, whether it's a, between a husband and a wife, between parents and children, bosses and workers, it just puts it over the top because they're already stressed out from just trying to deal with all the regulations and the dangers of the coronavirus. So it doesn't take that much. Things that normally they can handle on their own, uh, they can't because there just isn't the bandwidth for it anymore. And um, you know, you have somebody in your family who's sick, and um, in the beginning of the coronavirus, the first I don't know whatever it was, year, eighteen months, you couldn't see them in the hospital. You know, you could have a family member who's dying and you can't see them. Uh, so it brings an already stressful situation of having a family member who's sick or dying and makes it 
so much worse because of the added problems. Or you you have somebody, you know, we live here in Hawaii, you have somebody that is not doing well on the mainland and you can't go see them because it's too dangerous. And, and even now that they've, you know, list, lifted a lot of the regulations, people are still very worried, especially now because of the new variant, numbers are going up all over again. So uh, has that answered your question? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, when we talked earlier, you described it as background noise, which I also thought was very descriptive. That normally in our life, we have all this background noise, uh, but with the pandemic, the background noise has become so loud that it's overwhelming. Right. Uh, uh, which again, was a very good way to describe it. My question to you is, how do we deal with people who are so overwhelmed that, uh, seems overwhelming in itself for us to deal with. How do we help them, the people who feel overwhelmed? Well, sometimes it's just helpful to reflect back what's going on because it's sort of like background noise. After a while, you don't hear it, you know, white noise, yeah. right? And unless somebody, unless, until it gets turned off, it's sort of like, you know, when, you, when the refrigerator is running, you don't hear it until it shuts off. It's like that. If somebody says, oh, the refrigerator is running, it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, or you somebody comes in and they're having a lot of problems just doing their life now. And you point out, well, it's not just you. You know, there's all these new problems that everybody has right now. Everybody in the world has right now. And it's not really that surprising that you're feeling the way you do. Just naming it, calling attention to it, sometimes, you know, allows somebody to take a breath. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's talk about breath for a second, because uh, that's where I was thinking that was leading. You know, when the noise gets so loud for me, and it's just overwhelming, and then all of a sudden it cuts off, and there's this great feeling of well-being. Yeah. All of a sudden I take this, and my God, I hadn't realized it was so loud. And now the quiet comes in and washes over me, and I feel good. Uh, how do well, you? Well, it's funny. I, I, well, one way that I am very, very lucky because uh -huh. the, I accidentally stumbled upon uh, a wonderful solution. Um, up until the pandemic happened, I had a regular office in Kailua in a medical office building here. And at first I had to deal like everybody else, everybody moved online. And so I was doing telehealth, which I found personally exhausting. I don't know why, but it's looking at somebody on a screen. I mean, this is not everybody's like, this is me. I found that like really tiring and less effective because People were at home, they had all these distractions. People don't tend to take it as seriously if they don't have to go somewhere and be separated from their normal habitat. You know, I'm trying to do therapy and there's a kid screaming in the background or people walking back and forth or somebody deciding, oh, this is a nice time to have lunch while I do this. <laughs> and so I, I, I didn't like the telehealth. So then it got to the point where I was working in the office, but everybody had a mask on. And to be a therapist and not be able to tell, is this person frowning or smiling or, you know, to, to read facial cues, I, I thought was impossible. So I went to the store and I bought two big tents and I put them up in my backyard. And I'm very lucky because my backyard is on Kailua Beach. So somebody comes in and we've replaced the background noise of the pandemic with the sound of waves and birds and trees. And people sit down and, and the first time they come, it happens every single time they sit down and they go, oh, this is really nice. I don't have to say a word. Immediately, the stress level comes down from being out in nature, from hearing those sounds that I just described. You know, I'm already helpful without opening my mouth, <laughs> which That's is true. usually a good idea. <laughs> That's terrific. And I can vouch for that because I've been with Steve in his backyard many times. And it is glorious, Steve. 
I mean, we, we're so lucky to live here to not take advantage of it would really be, I mean, it was an accident. I did it out of necessity. And then it, you know, all of my clients that I used to see in the office are telling me when this thing is over, don't go back to the office. Just yeah. do it here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so that's one thing. I mean, and in general, being in nature is incredibly therapeutic. You know, there's, there's a whole... There's a form of therapy. I think it's called forest bathing now. <laughs> Terrific. Serious. Yeah. Great. And, um, Great name. I have plenty of clients who are surfers and mm -hmm. that's their therapy. They're, some of them are in the water every single day. Myself, I jog on the beach and do all my exercise and then jump in the ocean. And, I, you know, I feel like it would be sinful not to take advantage of it because to, you know, work on my own mental health is helping my clients. So it, I don't feel too selfish. <laughs> if yeah, I can absolutely. spend, you know, one or two hours a day doing that, I'm better at my job and happier person. And I think that's true for everybody. I mean, there's no panacea. You know, I don't tell people to do exactly what I'll do. I'll share with them what I do and, uh, you know, and say, well, maybe this will work for you. Maybe not, you know, but it's something else. One of the things that, uh, well, this is going way back, I have to admit, but when I started off counseling, I was in a medical building like you were too. And I started off counseling adolescents. That was my first uh, client load was strictly adolescents. And I had a very hard time counseling in that uh, medical building. Uh, it was my turf, it was not their turf. They were not comfortable in that medical building. And then nature took a hold. This was, I hate to admit it, uh, in 1970, 71 in Silmar, California, we had a big earthquake and my medical building got split right down the middle. Oh, wow. And luckily this happened early in the morning, nobody was there. But when I came to work that day, the building was leaning in half <sighs> and there was this big half between it. And so, we, so not having anything to do, the group that I was working with, which was a group of uh, six counselors and a director, uh, we moved to my little apartment, started there, but then we rented a house. Um, but before then, when I was in that medical building, I did everything I could just to simply get out of the medical building. I took my adolescence and we went to a park. Sometimes we would shoot baskets, you know? Uh, took them places where it was more their turf. And um, I think that's, uh, you know, I, I look toward that as one of the possibilities, sort of the unexpected uh, advantages when something terrible happens, like an earthquake or a coronavirus pandemic. Um, there's always different ways we can do things because like you say, all the clients are different. And they have different needs and they react to things differently. So uh, it's always an interesting phenomenon. And one thing as therapists, uh, you're never bored. <laughs> no, I'm never bored. And I have some clients I find are much more comfortable uh, walking and talking. So yeah, exactly. we walk along the water's edge. Yeah. And it's great because the, the water makes enough noise. So our conversations are, are, are still private. <laughs> <laughs> It just looks like, you know, we're two people like all the other people walking along the beach. Yeah. And, um, I remember when I first started, I had, uh, this is probably not a good insurance thing. I don't do it anymore. Who's ever listening. I would go driving in a car with a client yeah. because they were comfortable doing that. Or just sitting in a car, uh, looking at an overlook, you know, yeah. so it's something like you say, it's more their turf. It's not my turf, you yeah. know, something more, more familiar. I mean, I get freaked out going to doctor's offices all the time. <laughs> I don't find that comfortable. <laughs> Truly. So, and I'm going to a lot of doctor's offices, and that's no fun. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a little white coat syndrome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Let me go back to the family thing. You mentioned that, uh, you know, of course, you're a licensed uh, marriage and family therapist. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the differences and some of the things you do in uh, when you're counseling couples, uh, when you're counseling parents, 
And when you're counseling kids, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the differences there uh, and how that goes? Well, with couples, you mean in general, not in terms of yeah. the pandemic? Just well, with the pandemic being the overall reality, but in oh. with the general problems. Well, in general, um, I always tell couples I have three clients. I have, you know, him, her, or him, him, and her, her, and the couple, right? So I also had to get very comfortable with listening to somebody tell me something, saying like, you know, it happened like this. We were crossing the street and, you know, there was a big pothole. And then somebody else saying, that never happened. I wasn't with you that day. And me saying, I agree with you to both of them. <laughs> <laughs> because I wasn't there, first of all. And right. I don't believe that either one of them is lying to me intentionally, right? Yeah. So I, what I'm saying that when I, I agree with them, what I really mean is I, I want to validate that they're being as honest and as truthful as they can be from where they are at. And to, I'm not the grand arbiter of the truth, and it's not for me to fix it. And, you know, I see my role in all those situations, whether it's couples, individuals, families, as helping them figure it out. Uh, I don't come up with the answers. I try not to even give advice uh, for two reasons. People don't take it. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. And I know I'm at my best when I know that I don't know the answers. Um, I see my role as, you know, sort of staying behind, staying with them, listening, reflecting, and helping them figure out how to make things work better. Um, and with couples, I've learned it's not my kuleana to decide who should stay together and who should break up. So people, all the time we'll say, so do you think, you know, there's any hope for us? Should we just call this thing off? <laughs> and that's not my call. Uh, I don't know. I'm amazed uh, sometimes to me, you know, I would, I think, you know, they've been yelling at each other for an hour now. This is probably the last time I'm ever going to see them. And at the end of the yelling for an hour, they say same time next week. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, with children, or when I say children, I mean anyone that is under 18, mm -hmm. uh, still a minor legally. Sometimes I'm faced with a special problem in that I give them the same confidentiality speech that I give everybody. Uh, and with a, a little extra thing, because they're a minor, I tell them I will not share anything with anybody, including their parents, unless I see it as imminently dangerous to mm. themselves or somebody else. Sure. And sometimes that's a hard call. It's not black or white, right? Yeah. Um, and I, it's, I don't have a hard line on that. You know, sometimes, you know, I've been a parent, I'm still a parent. And I think, well, if I were in their shoes, how would I feel if a therapist kept this information? For me. So what I always try to do is see the problem is if I betray the trust of the minor child, then I'm going to lose that. Right. So what I always try to do first, and this actually works with couples also, because sometimes one member of a couple will tell me something and say, oh, don't tell my partner. First thing to do is tr try to get them to tell their partner, or in the case of a child, to tell their parents what's going on, to try to convince them that this is really, you know, that openness and honesty in the long run is definitely a better way to go. Unless, you know, if I think that the parent is dangerous to the child, then yeah, I'm not going to do that, then there's other issues. But that's how I deal with that. And then family dynamics is, uh, is probably the trickiest, you know, when I've got the parents and multiple children all there together. And I, you know, I'm sort of like the, um, I don't know, what do you call the guy who runs the three ring circus, <laughs> the master of ceremony? <laughs> uh, that's tricky. Um, you know, and sometimes you, 
you know, I've learned probably in one of your classes, Ken, like how sometimes you strategically side with one person or another, and you make it very obvious. You'll say, well, you put your chair over next to this, but I think I'm going to decide with Johnny over here this time. Let's see what that feels like. And another thing that I particularly like to use because of my theater background is role play to try to get people to see what it feels like to be the person that they're fighting with, to sit in their shoes. Um, that is a very powerful tool that I like to use a lot um, because it really can light a little light bulb in somebody's head to see what it feels like to be on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, I know you also do groups and uh, in like group counseling as I do too. One of the best experiences I ever had with dealing with parents and a child is family group therapy. And I got this in my first crack out of the box. My mentor showed me how to do this. And we would bring in three or four families, mother, father, child, three or four of these trios. And we would sit down and we would have them talk about things that are bothering them. And the fascinating thing to me and the most therapeutic thing that I ever saw was the fact that the parents never listened to their own kid, but they listened very closely to the other kids in the group. And the kids who never listened to their parents <laughs> listened very carefully to the other parents in the group. And it opened up communication like I've never seen before or since. And uh, it was a fascinating, fascinating way to do family therapy. There are many ways, like you're pointing out, many ways to reach people. Um, and it depends upon our situations. And certainly in our situation with the coronavirus, it's very, uh, very unique and very different for us. I, I love groups as well. But the most and I did some of that family group stuff when I was working um, for Salvation Army uh, in a drug treatment place. They would have family sessions without the person with the addiction. Uh, we wow. would meet uh, once, I think it was once a week uh, at a church, mm -hmm. all the families together. There'd be a whole bunch of families. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, it's exactly what you're saying. Uh, it's like, we can't hear the people that we we're, we're so tightly connected to, but if it comes from the outside, so you know, we, I guess our defenses drop a little bit. We're just somebody listening to somebody else, and then this little thing goes always like, "Oh yeah, that's what I heard so and so say." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very pop. group therapy is super powerful. The hardest part is guess getting people to to join up. Uh, groups are really hard to start. People, are, are, there's so much stigma and shame and people don't want the world to know about their particular problems. Um, you know, everybody somehow thinks that nobody's got problems like we have until they get into the other room with everybody else and they go away thinking, oh boy, we're so much better off than they are. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Well, we could talk about that a lot, you know, uh, but like you say, we're running short. I wanted one last question for you before we, before we call it a day. What's the one thing that you've tried recently that's looked very promising? What's the one thing that you're looking forward to doing more of as far as helping people, uh, you know, in your, in your work? Because I think we're going to need lots of new things, not only because of the coronavirus, but because of all the other new pressures and new things that are happening in the world today. So if you could just sort of give us a, a preview of what might be coming up or what might or what looks promising. I probably should have studied your questions more carefully before I came on. Um, <laughs> one thing, I don't know. One thing, this is not a new thing and it's something that I've done from time to time, especially when I'm working with a couple uh -huh. where they're really on the brink. They can't talk to each other at all. 
I'll have them sit facing each other, looking each other in the eyes for three minutes without speaking. And there's something about that that softens people. Very often, tears start to flow or laughter will happen. And it's, it's a nice little tool because sometimes words just make everything worse. Um, people get defensive, but when you're just looking in someone's eyes, it's, it's, you can't hide. Yeah. And you, and you open up. I agree. I think that's a very powerful technique. Uh, one of the things uh, that when we're looking at each other and arguing, we tend to be saying the same things over and over and over again. And just sitting there, like you're saying, looking at each other, you're not saying those things over and over again. You're not opening old wounds. You're just looking into that face which can bring you back to when you first began looking at that face across from you. Yeah. You Some of those good, good feelings. Yeah. The other time. thing I'll do sometimes, people, you know, for one of the problems with the pandemic is you can't touch people. But yeah. if they're a couple, they're still touching each other, thank goodness, hopefully. And I ask them to hold each other and to synchronize their breathing together. And to do that for a couple of minutes, again, without talking, yeah. just holding each other and feeling their body against the other person's body and getting their breath in time with each other. I see it says one minute now. <laughs> Steve, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. It's just always such a pleasure talking to you and trading ideas because the field that we're in is so difficult with so few answers especially with the new things that are happening with the coronavirus and uh, how to deal with grief, for instance, uh, with the war in the Ukraine and just everything that uh, is happening that seems to be, like we said before, overwhelming. So yeah. thank you so much for being here. I also wanted to thank, uh, you know, the Think Tech Hawaii people. I want to thank Jay and Haley and Mike and Eric and all the people who make this uh, show possible. And uh, again, thank you, Ken. Thank you for having me. It's yeah. always a delight to talk to you. Absolutely. And thanks again, Steve. Bye bye. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.